All right. Good morning, everybody. This is the next episode of WEBS Webinar Wednesday. I'm Thijs, I'm working at WEBS, and I'm welcoming you at this next episode. What appears to be, I think, um, yeah, of course, end March, we had a lot of breakfast sessions in our office planned. It We transformed it right away into a great episode uh, of, 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 I think, 40 episodes of, of, of webinars and those kind of things. And one of the first ones who were there was Mikael Umblet. Um, I'm very happy that he will be here today for the second time this year, because wow, this guy has energy. This guy has information on how we can adapt to these crazy times. Because I speak to a lot of businesses day by day who are struggling and uh, adapting their sales into this new situation. And if you want to win with sales these days, you need to start having the right foundations in place. And in this webinar, Mikael will share strategy and actionable tactics to get your sales foundations right. Um, and I say webinar, but when we briefly talked just before we started with you guys, he named this a 50-minute training. So you are the lucky ones this morning. Mikael, welcome. Over to you. How are you? You are going to train us, right? You're on uh, mute. Sorry. So thank you for, yes. for having yeah well voilà. thank you for having <laughs> me back and I while I was making I'm I've been creating a lot of new material for the whole corona and how do you deal with it. Yes. And I told instead of doing a webinar, why don't I just do a training, 50 minutes, hardcore training, what I teach scale-ups, what I teach software wow. companies, SaaS companies to win. So you'll have a lot of value. What I suggest is that because I tend to go like a train, I just accelerate. If you have <laughs> questions, put them in the chat. And I think you will actually interrupt me from time to time to ask me a question. I have 10 minute, minutes reserved at the end to answer any question you might have. Yeah. I will manage that chat and I'm happy that I have permission to stop the train at certain points because we're the lucky ones to get on that train today. Looking forward to it. Good. Go ahead. Thank you. Here we go. I'm going to kill this. Okay, perfect. So everybody keeps coming with, to me with the same question. Michael, we need to close more faster. We're not getting enough deals and all of that. And one of the big reasons that is, is because actually a lot of people say no to you and even worse a lot of people even more don't say anything i mean i'm belgium you kind of hear this in belgium we're really bad in this we always say uh-huh uh-huh but we actually mean no right so and the way i look at this is that i call this that sales is like swimming in the lake of rejection you get no every day you come home your kids start being annoying you get no again so we gotta find a way to deal with the rejection we gotta find a way to solve this. And there are two things we need to look at. We need to look at the beginning, which is everything that has to do with fuel for your machine. And we need to look at the machine itself. So today I'm gonna talk about fuel and machine. I'm gonna talk about how do you tie it all up together. And then I'm gonna go into a lot of tactics, what you can do. And I also have several slides on the whole Corona thing. Can you replace physical meetings with online meetings, etc., etc.? You'll see. So when we say sales, I think of these guys, I call them the BMW sales car guys. They look nice, they, they, they always dressed in suits, but the reality, what I see is something else. I see most sales teams like being pure chaotic. And the reason for that is because what we do is when we hire sales, we actually hire extremely social people. Fundamentally, social people compensate their chaos by talking, you know, you've been there, right? You do a forecast, you talk to these sales guys and you walk out of the meeting and you think, man, that was a good meeting, I feel good. But actually, the content was shit. These guys, boys or girls, they just find a way to make you feel good. That's their job. So we got to find a way to, to structure this in a much different way. So when we look at sales, basically for me, it sits in the middle. The whole thing about marketing, and I know because I've written this book about all these things about marketing, for me, the fundament is to get leads. Very simple. And then once you've sold it, you have customer success that they will use your software, your service, your product, basically customers are being happy. So they buy more, they generate leads. So sales sit in the middle with two things. One side, you have everything that has to do with the relationship, online, offline, 
talk about that later. On the other hand, everything that has to do with the process. So if we then take a step back and we look at selling, selling for me actually has four major components. The first one is everything to do with attention. I got to grab you by attention. The reason I'm so energetic and sometimes I swear is on purpose because I can get your attention. I can control your attention. I use slides. I use visuals because, again, I can get your attention. By the way, they move because we're all cats trying to catch the mouse, right? So one of my best sales advice is always use something visual or start writing on a blackboard or whatever you do because people cannot resist the urge to follow. But attention is not enough. In order to sell, we need something more. We need trust. And trust is something that is obvious for large companies. But if you're growing and you're going into even large companies, when you go into a new market, and they don't know you, what we got to do, we got to find a way to build this trust. And trust is something very intriguing. Trust, because I have several of these large investor groups, they hire me sometimes to sell stuff that does not exist. Is that, hey, Michael, set it up, see if you can get somewhere. And I'm able to sell things that do not even exist. And the reason why is because I'm really good in creating this trust. And how do I do it? Faces. We like faces. We trust people. Uh, social proof is not only faces. It can be numbers. It can be, it can be especially numbers. It can be logos. Some logos is more than enough to work. Now, is trust enough? No. I've seen that I, I made a big mistake there the last uh, two years, and then I figured it out. I was doing this very large deal with a uh, CEO, and he's, at a certain stage, he said to me, Michael, you get my attention, and two, I trust you can do it, but I'm not sure if my team will trust you. And I'm not sure if you can really, if you can perform this because you're a small team, right? So what I needed to add is something called structure. And structure gives peace of mind. So I used to remove all these slides and all this explanation of how we do things, but I realized that you need to explain and how you will tackle the problem. That gives really peace of mind. And I'm going to show you immediately an example after the last point, how people use structure to get to make better pricing. Right? And then the last part, of course, you know, there is a four missing here, right? Uh, I'm just building up the attention. Is you got to be easy to buy from. It seems, seems so obvious, but I see this in a lot of scale-ups. Somebody asks something and then it takes them three days to respond. Or then you ask, give me a quote and it takes you, four days to answer, that's no go. So you, one of the things I do when I help sales teams and when I help larger companies and even smaller is I will start looking at the process. I will literally draw the process and I will start looking over and over again to remove all the steps of friction. It's like sandpaper. I gotta, and it's not something you can fix the first day. It's like, you gotta go back and back and back and back until the machine is like really, really going well. I promised you an example of structure. Here's a story. One day my wife gets this, uh, gets an invitation in the mailbox, white mail as they call physical mail. And it says, uh, you are invited to a VIP exclusive. You're thinking the same thing as I'm. If I see VIP exclusive, I know how late it is. Anyway, it was about garden furniture. You had to make an appointment and you had to go there in the weekend. You see, I'm getting nervous already. So after a long debate, and I tell you in a relationship, you have to pick your battles. I said, okay, I'll join you. So what happens is we show up on a Sunday afternoon. There is a lady waiting for us, which was our personal sales, getting really nervous already. And basically it was a big warehouse with lots of furniture. But this lady would basically walk us through this very large hangar. And while she was walking us through, she kept saying, ah, today, only today, we give you 35% discount and we're better and cheaper than the others, blah, 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 blah. And, and, and in, in order to avoid me getting, getting not me, but let's say my, my girlfriend, getting nervous and that we would accept the price, she would always, every 10 minutes, she will, would walk by this sign, and this is the sign. I took, a, I took a picture, actually. This is the sign. And that sign, she would always say the same thing. She would say, listen, traditionally, traditional shop, you have the uh, fabricant agent, is a lot of in-between steps. But we, we can source directly from the makers. That is why you get 35 discount. That is why you basically get a better price. 
And this is a very good example of how structures should look like. One, visually, the left, it has the word traditional. You don't want to be traditional. It also has all these steps. So one of the concepts you could do, and this works in any business, is you could use this type of tech technique as a pure sales technique to explain pricing, but you can also use this to explain how you work, why you're faster, why you're better than your competition. This is a very B2C view, but it could be B2B, right? So another one, if we could combine attention, trust, and structure into one approach, here is a good example. These are personalized videos, little videos. It's 20 seconds, 30 seconds, where you get an email or you get actually these days a lot of WhatsApp messages and that kind of stuff where you literally say, hi, Mark, click play. If you're Mark, you will click play. There is no escape. And you say, hey, Mark, trying to reach you. Now you see my face, da, 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 da. You know, something really funny. And I've seen a lot of, especially I see this in a lot of software companies now where they really perfected it. You do it only for the strategic accounts, but you actually, your conversion ratio multiplies by three. Um, works really well. If you tell me, yeah, Michael, I'm in a traditional sector. That's exactly what you need to do because they're not used to doing stuff like this. Two tools, Soapbox, bomb, bomb. Uh, I think that HubSpot these days also has it in there. Personalized videos, really great on sales side, but also on customer success side when there is shit, when you can explain something. Now, if we really want to go forward, we, we got to start with the end. We got to start with closing, which is the fundamental goal. And that is where there has been a major change in sales over the last years. If I look at a very classic sales process, it always starts like this. I'm aware of a problem. I got to figure out the problem. So what I do, I will look for the problem. Write it down. Look for the problem. I will not look for the solution. So if all of you keep making websites and keep posting about your solution, your product, I'm not even looking for it because I don't know my problem. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the problem. I'm going to look for mind line. I'm going to try to solve the problem, which is key. And then I'm going to select a service and I'm going to integrate it into my life. Now, and of course, reality is not that linear. The reality doesn't work that way because the moment I hit the website, the moment I start watching something, I will be tracked by all these tools and I will be proposed competitive solutions and I will just be hit and hit and hit and hit and hit. And it has become extremely simple to switch. So what happens is these days, customers uh, get stuck between education and selection. They go back and forth. The question is then, when do we close? Well, you see that big green line? Well, that actually makes a difference. When I'm looking for information, stop selling to me. 90% of all websites do this. Product, service, we are fantastic. We are the best. These are all the prices we won. Basically saying, you're an idiot. I'm smarter than you. It's not going to work. Stop doing that. Most prospect, most people have no clue how to solve it. They have no idea if you're capable of doing it. They're looking for information, how to do it themselves, actually. That's where we got to go, but we cannot sell. The moment I start giving buying signals, give me a demo, show me more, how much does the shizzle cost? That's when you start selling. And that's a fundamental difference. It might be an extra step, but you can mechanize it so you actually move much, much faster. Now, the reason why is very simple. Uh, we basically hate salespeople. It's simple. We all love to buy. It gives endorphins. Uh, it makes me happy. Uh, that's why all the Belgians are now shopping in the Netherlands because they can't shop in Belgium. So they all run over there because it makes them happy. Um, but yet, we don't trust sales. So if we know trust is the game, we got to fix this. And the only way to fix it is to do something else. So if I want to sell to you in this conversation, who should I talk about? You or me? I should talk about you. You are the most important, so stop talking about you. I don't know why people keep doing that, and I have to correct sales every single time. I said, sorry, my friend, you are not that interesting. Sorry, your company, I don't give a shit because I don't know what you do. Yeah, but let me explain. No, I want you to talk about my problem. I want you to talk about me. Fundamental change, do it, fix it. I'm going to explain you how to do it, right? So if we really start thinking about it, not selling, is a new sales. It's basically a way more subtle approach to sales, right? So let's talk, let's go one step back because I immediately jumped into the closing, into the sales machine. I wanna take a step back. I wanna, I wanna jump to sales fuel. 
Sales fuel means everything that you can do so people come to you. And what we see is that if I would go into the world and I want to sell my product or service, then I start spreading the news, I will have a conversion ratio of about 2%. Um, and that is because in the world, there is always somewhere a house burning. And I come with my fire extinguisher and they will buy it. And then we can discuss shapes and foam or powder or whatever, and water or air, I don't care. But if we do the same technique to people that they have a house nearly built, impossible to burn, and I'm there with my fire extinguisher, it's not going to work, right? So I started thinking deeply about this. And you know, when you think very long about something and very deeply, you make extremely simple slides. So the more simple something looks, the most of the time, the more it has been thought through. So here's how we get to the 2%. We talk about our product. Fundamentally, you're offering a shortcut in time. Any company in the world with enough time and money could do what you're doing, in all bluntness. So what we do is we basically offer a shortcut in time. And while I was thinking about this, I started thinking, how does the journey then work? Well, it always works like this. I want to learn something I had not really learned. I want to be inspired. I watch a webinar. I read a book. I, I see something on LinkedIn. I don't care. And I get inspired. Now, here's the thing. A CEO of a company or an executive of a company, his dream is probably sell the company, world domination, have a happy team. I don't know. But the people working for that person have different dreams. They think about career. They think about very different things. So inspiration has several layers. And I made a very big thinking mistake. I went on a stage, had 500 people in front of me and did this really cool speech with videos. And then when they were inspired, I said, here is my product. And I felt the room literally collapsing. So I thought I'm doing something wrong. And there was something wrong is something very simple. You, in this webinar, when you get inspired by some of the stuff I said, you know what you're going to do? You're going to think, I can do this myself. And what are you going to do? You're not going to buy any products. You're going to Google Michael. You're going to go to his YouTube. You're going to start digesting and saying, oh, this is cool. I'm going to try it myself because you think you can do it yourself. Normal. I have the same. Everybody has the same. So what we got to do is we got to jump to this and we got to leverage this. In French, they say a fond. It means we got to leverage this fully. We're going to teach them how to do it. Of course. Think about this. It is not because I share you my best idea that you can operationalize this. Some of you will, but a lot of you will think, I don't have time for this. Let me talk to the expert. So what you're trying to do is you're basically trying to build content sales material that inspires and educates. And that will automatically lead you to your product. And that will scale which way more because it's not selling, actually. And that's, that's the book I've written about it, basically, that says the title is Nobody Knows You. If you want to scale and you want to go to markets, well, you got to fix the basic problem. Fix the nobody knows you. How do we going to fix it? By inspiring and especially educating. And the people that don't buy, you shouldn't worry about because they become your ambassadors. Now, give you an example, right? How does this work in sales, Michael? Well, it's simple. Here is a last slide. So as of today... I never want to see any last slide that says questions or thank you because that's utter bullshit. That's a waste of time for everyone. What you do is in your, when you do a sales presentation, when you do something that has to do with sales, you want to sell, you got to have next actions. So your last slide, your last thing you present should always be this type of visual. Next steps, next actions, two choices. Choice number one is always inspiration, education. Here you see the one, the middle one, the top three blockchain use case. doesn't matter. Inspiration, education. Choice number two should always be we can help you shortcut. That could be a demo, but everybody's doing a demo. Maybe you want to do a free workshop. Maybe you want to do something that has a lot of value, but where the threshold of friction is pretty low. And the reason I do it this way is because we don't realize it, but a lot of our salespeople and, and myself, when we go out, we are so eager to sell. So what do we do? We say at the end, you know what? Shall I make a quote for you? Shall I do this? Shall I do that? And we're basically hoping, which is wrong too, we are giving ourselves work. 
if the customer is not interested, why am I making a quote for them? It's insane, right? So what I want to do is I want to give the customer an option to make a choice. And if they make a choice, it, one, it gives them freedom because if I tell you what to do, you won't do it. And we're human, especially in the Netherlands, right? No, bad joke. Um, but if I give choice, it's easier, one. And two, actually, I give freedom to not buy. And that's very intriguing. Because what, what happened in a lot of meetings, if I do this trick, what you see here, and of course I have my contact deal, what you see, and not my contact, but Matthew, what you see here is that people that want, that doesn't want to buy, and a lot of them don't want to say it, right? So they'll go, uh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. No, if they're not interested, they'll say, oh, that's interesting. Send me the food supply chain thing here. Send me that educational stuff. And I know in the back of my mind, I put them in my marketing queue, I keep them up, and I send them later. So keep in mind, always give choice, inspiration, education, selection. If there is one thing you should remember, it's this one. Now, next one. So how does that work? Well, here you see another example. You either talk to the expert, get a meeting, or you give inspirational, educational material. You're going to get these slides, so you don't need to make a screenshot. Now, so we know, we talked about fuel, we talked about the machine, the closing, we talked about the technique. So how, why don't we talk very quickly about the process? Sales has, once you get into the funnel, this is called a funnel, and typically this is logged in any CRM system, you have several steps. And I'm going to show you and explain a little bit the steps that lead to the team, that lead to how do you fix some of this, right? So here are I think what's it, six, seven steps that work in 90% of the cases. That means with everybody, right? So first of all, you gotta figure out it's qualification. You gotta figure out if people are able to buy your stuff. There are many techniques. There are about 27, I think even more, 28 qualification methodologies. I'm gonna give you the most simple one. Do they have the budget to do it? Am I talking to the right person, authority? Do they need it? What's the time frame, right? What we see now that, especially in SaaS, for instance, this is a little bit different because what you do is every call, every meeting, you have to requalify, which is a very different topic. I'm not going to go too much into that today, but let's say you just got to figure out those four things. The most important, do they need it, All right? So how do I figure out? I go in, I ask, I start at the end. I said, okay, so when would you want to have this implemented? If they don't have a date, you know you're in trouble. If they say, ah, we kind of thinking in three months, okay, and then you can work your way backwards and say, okay, clear. So who would be implementing this? Who of your team? Ah, oh, we need about three weeks. Da, da, da. So how would this get through procurement? How, how is the decision made? Is it you or is, you see, it's very normal conversation. Don't forget, a lot of salespeople do not dare to ask these questions because they're difficult. A question like, uh, do you have the budget to do this? Is a very difficult question. I don't think you should immediately ask this. I think you probably ask this in the second meeting or when things start moving forward, that is when I would start talking about this kind of stuff. So qualify, go to the next move, you present, you do a demo, then they say, oh, interesting, give me a quote. You make a quote, you then start negotiating. That's where it takes a long time large deals, somewhere between nine to 18 months, small deals within three months. If you go SaaS, it depends on the amount, if you're between three to six months, I mean, it all depends. Validation means they said yes, but you do not have the PO. You can still lose there, right? Okay, that's why it's on 90%. Closing, you get it. If deals get stuck for ages and ages, you put them in nurture. That's the last thing, should actually be 0%, and then people can actually put it back in. Now the question is, What's the percentage of closing? If I start looking into the Benelux and I, I look into, I helped over 250 companies. If I, if I make a general assumption to all of their pipelines, I think the good ones are somewhere between 13 to 15%. That means from qualification, if I have 100 in there, no, let me do it reverse, it's easier. If I have one closed deal, I need three proposals, and I'll need nine in qualification, but you don't make a business plan on one deal. So that means if I have 10 deals in closing, I need 30 in proposal and I need 90 in qualification. And that is where the major problem starts. You probably do not have enough volume in that pipeline 
to get to these numbers. And a lot of companies come to me and they always ask me, hey, Michael, uh, I don't have enough closing. Okay, do you have enough volume? No. Problem number one. Problem number two, uh, we struggle with pricing and things are not moving fast enough, right? Problem two and three combined. Typically what you're doing is you don't, you're, the problem you're solving or the way you're talking about is not big enough. Two, if it's not big enough, you can't ask enough and then you don't have that velocity or deal. Now, what happens if I start going to a new business, you hire me and I'll start going to business, start calling, start emailing, and start doing webinars, all that stuff. So I start filling the pipe and it will be look something like this. Well, I have a very strong opinion about this and I promise not to swear, but this is what I think about it. It doesn't work that way. If I start and I start phoning, I start emailing, I spend some time on qualification and then people say, hey, come over, come and show me. And I spend a lot of time in that presentation and then in proposal. And I get, I don't get this nice funnel. I get something that looks like, uh, I don't know how that's a ge geometrical figure is called. But basically the weight of what I do as a sales is sitting in the contact, the communication, the back and forth and the pricing. I mean, the budget discussion. That means that I will have enormous impact on my revenues because they will start fluctuating. Meaning when I start in the beginning, I'll be, I'll, I'll be say, oh, I don't have anything in the pipeline. And then I'll start phoning, doing all the deals. And then I go to peak, I close, oh, da, da, and then I'm so happy. But then duck, I go back down because I forgot to keep feeding, fueling my machine. So we got to fix that and we got to fix that differently we got to really start looking at it separately so here is actually a model so first you have everything you can call it marketing fuel sales fuel doesn't matter the way it works it's all geared around bait the worm that you put on your hook and what's the worm well it's their problem right we're going to explain that immediately then it leads to a conversation and the conversation basically leads to the sales machine where i can run the biggest mistake people make is that they try to shortcut LinkedIn. Hey, Will, this is Michael. I run a sales strategy, buy my stuff. It's not going to work, right? LinkedIn is made to do conversations. The conversations lead eventually to sales. You can't shortcut that. Don't try to do it, especially B2B. Forget it. you got to build, rebuild your machine differently. So let's look a little bit to sales methodologies. And I think it's, it's my duty to make you a summary of all the sales methodologies that exist currently, right? And then you're thinking, how the hell? Well, let's go there very quickly. First, do it yourself. I'm going to talk about it. Two, transactional selling. Well, I don't think that's the aim of this webinar. So let's go to something very classic. When I started 20 years ago, yes, I'm that old. My boss said, Michael, you got to do solution selling. Solution selling is very simple. Your prospect knows exactly what is wrong, comes to you, says, this is my problem. I want you to solve it. The advantage goes very fast. The disadvantage, you're easy to compare and the only thing you have left is price. The reaction to that is, to, is goes together with the rise of consultancy agencies. When the consultancy agencies started rising, what they started doing was they would find large customers and their large customers actually knew something was wrong, but they didn't know exactly what. So what you do is you diagnose, you sell, uh, you sell actually, uh, how to say that you sell, uh, you sell your consultancy services. And of course, after three months of consultancy services, you say the solution is to buy my stuff, right? Now, there has been a lot of trust issues. And what happens there is that things delay. The advantage are very large deals, but the disadvantage, especially when you look to software, you have lots of these proof of concepts, right? Now, the reaction to that, it goes together with the rise of the startup scale-up scene. What they did was they invented stuff and they had to go to companies and then the companies had no clue they had this problem. So what you call that is provocative selling. You have to come in and you have to make sure that people understand that this is a problem. The advantage is it goes really fast. This advantage works well with executives if you do it the wrong way they'll shoot you with a bazooka. Now, the question is, how does it work then? Well, well what we got to do is we got to try and flip this, this, this funnel, right? So the way, instead of doing the classic, why do I need why now, why you? We should try and push it the other way. We should start with why you? 
So remember, if I share all this educational content, people will consider me as the expert. They will come to me and the why you is already gone. You are the company. I mean, it's a very similar thing. The only thing I need to do from a sales perspective is to shortcut, to speed it up by feeding them why they should buy it now. Why now? Because I know my deal velocity is slow. I got to start squeezing it together, right? So how do we fix why now? And that's especially the teaching I wanted to give you today is how do we how do we do that, right? Um, and you see this book there. Uh, some of this content comes out of a book because it was well written. It was really good. So I'm just going to share it. So remember the three ones. We had solution selling, reaction to that consultative selling, reaction to consultative selling, provocative selling, right? So prospect walks into the room or I walk into the room. I got to talk to them. So I have to figure out what's the problem. First technique, they know the problem, solution selling. So they know the problem and they start talking, Michael, it's very simple. That's my problem. What I have to do to speed it up is I have to say, hang on, hang on, hang on. The problem you're talking to me about is way bigger than you think. You, my dear prospect, are completely underestimating how to tackle it. If I do that, and I then give the solution structure, if I do it, it will speed up the deal. Other alternative, prospect comes in, knows something's wrong, doesn't know what. What I have to do is I don't have to scare him because he's already in doubt. I have to do the opposite. I have to say the problem you think you have does not come from there, but it comes from this thing. I'm the expert. I'm telling you. And it's actually way easier to solve than you think. If I can do that, again, I will speed up the process. You see, structure here, how you do that is again important. Provocative, well... <laughs> You meet somebody and doesn't have a problem. Everything is fine. You got to do something else. You got to say, there is a big problem coming. Somebody is eating your market share and it's fast approaching. It's worse than it seems and it's not going to go away. It's extremely powerful to do it that way. Now, where is the magic, right? That is, you basically need three types of pitches. That's what you see here. The magic is, that is where I see most companies struggle. The magic is, you have to formulate the problem in such a way that you have the unique solution. And that is what's difficult, right? If you come in and you do very generic problems, I can solve, uh, I was in uh, guys that do uh, very intelligent machine learning in factories. And that is really generic speech. I'm like, guys, no, 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 no. You have to really spend a lot of time in trying to figure out the exact problem where you can be unique. So it's the phrasing of the problem that is where you win. And that is what you say in the beginning. Now, how do you do that? Well, I also learned there are two types of language. If you go to early adopters, you know, people that tend to try all new technology, you have to use the innovation inspiration type of language. So I, when I do newsletters, for instance, I have two. When I communicate, I have two styles. I have the inspirational stuff, but if I go to the very large companies that are a bit more traditional, if I do too much inspiration, they're scared. So what I do there is I have to do an educational language. And sometimes it comes down to swapping some words, swapping sentences, swapping energy. Typically, education is more use case inspired. Others have done it. Why are you not doing it? See, that kind of stuff. Now, one of the other things, I, I, uh, since this is a lesson, one of the other things I keep, keep being annoyed around is that people do not realize how to deal with hierarchy. And it's a very simple one. If we look into any company, we always have the executive suite. And then we have, let's call it a more operational suite. And what we do is we do the cookie cutter thing. We come in and we say, this is our pitch. It doesn't work that way because I got stuck. I did a speech once for um, uh, the CEO of a very large telco company can't tell you which one, but it has phone in their name. Um, and these guys fell in love with my speech. They said, this is amazing. We got to do this. It was big data, shizzle stuff. And they sent me then to the operational. And guys, so I had a team, five people in there, and I started doing the same speech. And when I'm done, I see their faces. And I thought the deal was in. And what happened was those five people were actually really upset because they said that's all fun and games you're talking about. 
but Michael, this is not going to work because you, my friend, are going to give us more work. And then I realized I made a mistake. So how do we fix this? So if we go into strategic, there are only two pitches that exist. Top line revenue, more sales, or bottom line, my shit will give you less cost. If I'm a CEO and write this down, if I'm a CEO, I will always, always prefer more revenue, new customers. Because the promise of new, the promise of the, of the, how do you say that, the hidden land, the promise of that is so strong, I cannot resist it. Also, from a pricing point of view, it's very hard to calculate the impact. If you do a cost reduction pitch, well, it's very easy. I can take a piece of paper and say, tuck, 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 tuck. So I'm going to push your price down. So always try to get in a piece of top line revenue. Language, no details. Uh, strategic vision, talk about tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. And actually, of course, graphs, ROI, charts, all of that. So stop having your funky, nice, cool pictures. No, add in some real elements of things that these people watch. Operations, very different. They care about today. They care about operational shizzle. They care about solving short term. So there it's pure expertise. There it's pure today. This is how we can fix you. And it's a very different language. Michael, if I have both in a meeting room, well, you got to blend some of this. Now comes the trick. So you do your pitch, you do your presentation, you do whatever you do. And then they say, send me some information. And what you do is you take your 60 slides of pure beautiness, things you cry in the evening about because it's so well not, you're so proud about your logo and all of that. And you send that to them and they never watch it because you make a fundamental thinking mistake. One, send less. Three, two to three slides, two to three pages, that's it. So you've got to start thinking about what's the fundament of what I'm offering here. What would that be? Well, it would be uh, very simple for me. It would be the problem, their problem, preferably visualized. It would be the structure of how you solve it. And it would be the next steps. That's it. And then also you add the material that they need. So if a CEO exec asks me something, I will send him the stuff he needs to go to operations or to the board. If an operational person asks me something, I will send them stuff for the CEO or for, for I mean, I, just send the material that they can use to get the approval. So that way you can shortcut your cycle, but nobody does it. Everybody thinks, no, I, I said this, so I got to send it to them. No, you got to create contrast on purpose because you need an excuse to go back. All right, this is a life game changer in sales, but it's up to you to do it. You've got to motivate the fundamental decision maker. So let's talk about follow-up. And you see me getting out of the lake of rejection in the meantime. Yeah, it was very cold uh, <laughs> that day. Um, so if we look at sales, we, we, I don't know why we keep doing this, but sales, what do we do? We, we look for a customer, we build a list, we start reaching out, we, we start interacting with them, and then we close the deal, right? And then we forget. Doesn't this remind you of something? For me, I, it, it always reminds me of like a one-night stand, right? You go in, you go out, and hey, it's fun, or sometimes it wasn't fun, but it's not really sustainable. And don't forget the energy and cost associated to finding that one customer is actually pretty steep. You don't realize it's called cost of acquisition. When you go into investment strategies and all of that, cost of acquisition is a very big thing because if the cost of acquisition is higher than the margin you make, you die. It's okay for startups, scale-ups to have that in a negative way, but once you get a solid business, no go. So we got to start thinking differently. So how does it work? Well, we have a first meeting. We kind of do. I send them the price. They get really disappointed. That's why there's a little dip. And eventually... I negotiate and I get to a deal. And then they kind of fade away. But every business has some type of recurrent thing in there. And if you don't have, you should have because you have already gained the trust. They've signed, they've paid. You have the trust. We got to leverage that. So what happens is we go away and you get into the desert. And if you're not careful, you're going to get into what I call the swamp of amnesia. They'll forget you. And that's the exact right moment that somebody else could step in and take over. What we got to do is you got to beat that. So we got to make sure that in order to get to renewal, in order to get there, we, on time, we have to ask them a question or we have to do something. So the beginning, I call it Romeo and Julia. We're happy. We're in love. It's fantastic. 
But if we want to, if they would have been married to keep the relationship going, we got to start doing something, right? And the best sales guy I've ever met is, was a BMW car sales guy. I'm sitting in, so I bought a car, BMW, doesn't matter which one, bought a car, is showing me in the car all the buttons, too many buttons. And uh, he gets a phone call. He, he looks at me and he says, can I take the phone call? And I said, uh, yeah, of course you can take the phone call. So he goes, eh. and he was somebody that he made an offer. And the guy, it was a guy, he said, I'm sorry, I decided not to buy BMW. I decided to buy uh, an Audi. And he said, okay, and he stayed very nice and friendly. He said, okay, I think clearly, I think you make the wrong decision, but I respect you. And, and he was very nice and he was a lot of laughter and it took two, three minutes. And then he then said, okay, good luck. Da, da, da. It is, and, and then he put down the phone. What he did then, he started scrolling in his, on his agenda. And I said, what are you doing? And he says, I'm adding this guy's contact and email because I've got to phone him in three years' times when the renewal is going to, when the, the leasing period is going to go down. And I looked at him and I said, this is insane to think it's such time frames. And he said, yeah, this guy is the best, most selling BMW car sales guy of whole of Belgium. So that technique works. It works in your business. Mechanize it, automate it. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually start thinking about how to do this. Eh? Why should we do it? You have your cost of scale. We have trust, but you don't have time. That's your biggest issue. You're not busy with it. You think, yeah, I'm doing that. And I new, 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 right? Remember, new is more important than cost. Well, exactly. New, new. Stop doing that. So the way to solve it is very simple. One, plan it. Be a machine. Two, should be you or someone else. The key is you've got to communicate. It's as simple as that. Three, value always wins. Maybe not in the short term, but long term it will win. That's why you've got to go back to them with something educational, not selling is the whole technique. And then there are two strategies. One, during Corona now, it's the most perfect moment to phone up somebody and to basically mail somebody, WhatsApp, doesn't matter which communication channel, and basically say, how are you doing? I've been worried. Another one. I have been, if I send an email to you saying, I have been thinking about you, you will open it. You will open it. And just be real. How are you? Listen. And you know what's funny? People get guilty and say, oh, it's good you phone because I was thinking, oh, oh, and by the way, before you go, bup, bup, they'll do the deal. You don't need to do anything. You just got to mechanize the mechanism of showing up and saying, showing that you care. By the way, if you're in the trenches, somebody that helps you in the trenches, you will never, ever forget. If somebody that's only there when you have big success, you ignore, you forget them, right? And that's what I call it the trenches strategy. And the last one I thought of you was a very good one. By the way, here is a tip. If you, if you have issues getting your invoice paid, <laughs> I, um, I used to have some issues with very large corporates. Um, so you would get into this... Uh, payment uh, department with 40 people and you don't know anybody and, and I couldn't get through. So I started sending them emails with a subject line said, I was thinking of you last night. Uh, and, and I saw the statistics, they would open these emails, right? So they would open the emails and the next sentence would say, hi, it would be great if you would think about my invoice. <laughs> and they would always pay them. Anyway, similar. So follow up. Actually, there is another thing. It, it's not only you've sold and you go back to them on the right moment. And what's the right moment? Eight, nine months is perfect. The second one is a lot of deals, and I call it the hidden opportunity, is they simply not followed up. What's following up? Well, depending which region you live, America is a bit more than Europe, but let's say five to six follow-ups is what you need. And what you figure out is that a lot of the deals, when they are qualified, what you figure out is that if they're qualified, 80% of them will buy within nine months. They might not buy next week or next month, but they will buy. So what we got to do is we got to really start building a machine around a follow-up mechanism. One, you have to add more channels, not only email, not only LinkedIn. By the way, Michael, how much should LinkedIn be in a B2B sales strategy? How much percentage should that take? Well, about 30 to 35%. It's, it's a lot, but you got to do it. So it's LinkedIn, cold calling, cold emailing, and then some crazy stuff. What's crazy stuff? WhatsApp text, uh, personalized videos, all of that. You've got to have an element of personalized approach there. Two, 
be consistent. Trust is defined by consistency. We can count on this guy. One of the emails I sent, for instance, as a follow-up is I say the following. I said, there is one thing you can be sure about in life, a good sales follows up. And everybody is positive to that. And they all laugh and they think it's funny, but fundamentally I'm following up, right? And it gives them peace of mind that if they do the business with me or whomever, they are, I will not let them fall. Three, measure. Measure the shit out of it. But that's why you need software and that's why you need systems. And I'm going to go into details what, but there are many ways of doing it, but measure it. I wanted to share you with an agenda. So, okay, Michael. So how would you set it up? Well, actually, to build a machine, you need specific people. You basically need somebody that's actually doing the job. And typically, this is sitting something called like an inside sales or a sales development trap, which is the same thing. But it, 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 most of the time, they are really good in outbound and really good in sales. They're not good in the follow-up. So it's different people. So here's an example of an agenda, what that would mean in a day. And you'll see. So you start a briefing, then you do research, social, because it's all about the lists and figuring it out. And then you reach out, big block of reach out, bam, 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 whatever system it is, break, reach out, bam, 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 bam. The key is to is to to be consistent, not one, but maybe 10, 20, but just do it like that. Then you take time for following up, which is emails, because people react. Lunch, then you do social. You stay away in the morning from social, because the problem is you can get sucked into the black hole of social. And you can also get sucked into the black hole of email. If I see a lot of sales and I walk in and it's extremely quiet, I know what they're doing. They're all emailing. I think it's keeping them busy. Yes, you got an email, but if I don't want to create, I don't want to work, I don't want to do the hard thing of pushing outside, which is tough and difficult and it's lake rejection, I know. You know what I do? I email, right? So you find the magical balance there. Of course, in the afternoon, you do again a reach out, but only uh, another part. And then basically what you do is you start preparing because your energy level will be so low what you then do is you basically start preparing the day after. What it comes down to, systems and lists. This way you have a very consistent machine while pushing. It's not overly crazy, right? Because that doesn't work either, but you also have all the social and everything in there. Okay, so Michael, the big question of today, can I replace my online meetings? No, can I replace my physical meetings with an online meeting? Yes, but something's different. The attention is different. This webinar, I mean, this, this teaching is one hour. That's long and I, I have lots of different, you see, this is a black slide, I have a white slide, I have lots of visuals, I'm, I'm you flapping my hands to keep your attention high. But it's very difficult to keep doing that for a day. So what we gotta do is we, if we say that the normal sales meeting would be one hour, what we have to do in an online digital world, we have to cut it in two. So you plan all your sales meetings 20 to 25 minutes. One, your prospect will love it because it's short. Two, you got to get your pitch way better, right? You got to really condense it in the right way. Your goal of the first short meeting is to get to the second meeting. So your hour will get cut in two because the reason is you don't build trust in such a short time online. They don't know you. So you got to split it. So shorter attention span, play with it. Two, and it shows you respect them. Two, trust builds not in that first one, but it builds if they see you physically and they can touch you, they can feel you, they smell you. We humans, we believe when we see it, right? Which is an argument for many things. But, but so what we do is we basically do the same thing, but we go from one online meeting to the second one. And that's the whole sales mechanism. One, I need to get to two. And it's way more efficient, right? And that way you'll see that your numbers will correspond way better and more efficient. Final slide, final slide, my friends. Uh, we're about 49 min uh, minutes and I promised you 50 minutes. So there's some room for question. One, I explained, find always a way to go back. That means next ac actions. Follow up is important. A lot of people have a tough time saying no in your face. So what we got to do is we got to be present, shorter calls, different channels to reach out, do things in a very, very different way. Quotes again, if you want to send a quote, if it's big numbers, be there to present it, just don't just send it. 
Another question I get a lot is, hey, Michael, should we in the first call talk about money? Yeah, of course. If somebody says, if somebody's really interested and you're talking and after 10 minutes said, how much will this cost? What I do is I'll always say the following. I will answer the question. That's one. Two, I'll probably say, look, if we look at a, a, a customer that's doing something similar to what you're doing, then I think you can look at a budget from, and I give a range. I'm just saying something, 20K to 40K, depending on all of that. And by me saying that range, in their mind, I immediately know what's happening. Two, if they say, no, it's not going to work, you've qualified. That's exactly the job of your first meeting, figuring out if they can pay it or not, right? So you should say a budget. Last but not sure, in a lot of cases, we sell services, we sell software, we sell products that are not really tangible. And, and I struggled a long time with it. I always said, I'm a bad sales guy. I want to sell something that I can take and put in the trunk of my car, right? It was a really old school idea, but I had this in my mind. Um, so what we got to try and do is we got to try and make sure that we can make some of the stuff we're talking about. We make it tangible. That's the reason why I have built a YouTube and I wrote a book and I do all of this stuff. And even to, to towards sales, like the collateral that you give, the material that you send, make it look nice, pretty, make it tangible. But again, don't be obvious product, product, product. No, put it into the educational jacket. You can put your exact product pitch into an educational jacket where you say, I'm going to explain to you how this works, how others have done it. One, two, three, four, five, tack, 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 tack. And then you basically at the end say, want to know more? Here is our expert, talk to him. And then you just put a screenshot of your product in there. That's it, right? It's going to be way more attractive. In the beginning, I'm at the end of my slide deck. In the beginning, I talked about the lake of rejection, but I actually think it's worse. It's a C. But if we, if you would actually just follow one of these slides that I've just explained to you, it's going to be you in that boat doing way, way better sales. Now, you know, I'm going to end with next actions because that's what I say, right? So if you want to know a lot more information, a lot of the stuff I've been explaining is actually more extensively explained on my YouTube channel. It has my name and I have a website on my name. It's pretty obvious where there's lots and lots and tons of material. I truly believe in sharing and caring. Now you know why. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the floor uh, for any questions. I have 10 more minutes. So I would say ask any question you want. I'm there, you have my time. Thank you so much. We have some questions. Um, first question uh, I would like to ask is when you are qualifying early stage, like your own calendar, your own agenda, you're making videos in a smart way, you are sharing knowledge and people are coming to you. A lot of people are coming to you and you can't help everybody, right? Because yes. you want to help the people who are uh, willing to pay for your services, et cetera. How do you handle the, 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 when the answer on the budget question is, uh, doesn't make you happy? How do you handle the word saying, no, sorry, we can't help you? So what you're, yeah, it's, it's a very luxurious problem, one. So I, I, I hope everybody has this problem. Uh, that's one. Two. Uh, you sometimes have this in, uh, in, in uh, service or SaaS companies, you have this where you get a lot of inbound, a lot of flow. One, it's okay to say no. I have no problem of saying no because it's up to you to do whatever you like to do and what you, where you think you can create value. The way I would do it is I would com start combining two things. One, I would start, if you have so many co people coming to you, I would actually all lead them to one webinar, for instance, you do every week where you explain the product and you actually give an idea of budget. So what you do is you put the qualification into a funnel into one big public place where people can join, make it a bit exclusive, all of that. And that's where you can say, that's where you go. Two, a lot of those people, um, that's how you solve your time, by the way. I say, no, that's where you go. You, you can do two per week if you have really a lot. Um, the second thing uh, I would really think about is that uh, in a lot of cases, I would try and find a very light product of whatever you're doing, which is pretty easy to automate or to make, which doesn't take a lot of time. And that's where I would ask a very low amount for it. And what you do is that product should be break even. And this is guru funneling. The way they do it is they'll offer you like the first step, like an online lesson or something small, something light. You pay 50 bucks, 150 bucks, which is a first cut 
in what they call your funnel, right? So first cut and that amount, you don't want to make money on that amount. What you want to do is you want to even get more skills. So you take that amount and you put that in ads and all of that stuff. So you basically get a self-fulfilling email building list machine. And then percentage, you basically say the next step is really expensive. You say it like that, is sorry, it is high quality, but it's really expensive. And you'll see that 90% of the people will immediately drop off. And then who remains are the right ones that you want. By the way, in the book that you see here, I explain this technique. If you don't know how it works, go look for the word value letters. It explains this technique of layering your value where you can join your pricing. Plus you can actually have people like you said, if you have too much coming in, you can push them back down in a very nice way because that's what you're looking for. You're trying to say no in a nice way, kind of the kind of finding ways that they maybe nine months can pay afford you. It's okay to be boutique. Boutique means you don't have too many customers, but you're very expensive. That's okay. But if you're boutique, it has to be top service and it has to be very exclusive. Makes sense. Um, a question from Jonas out of the chat. Um, you were talking about the education and, and inspire phase. Um, his question is, does it mean that you have two databases for uh, customers, one for the education phase, one for the inspire phase? Um, yeah, I basically, I have one database. What I do is I put a, it's funny when you start talking to people, you very quickly figure out if the person is more traditional or is like, uh, let's do it, let's try. Uh, so what I do is I actually put in my CRM system or your Google Sheet, whatever you're using, I will actually have a, a tick box that says, mm -hmm. Traditional, <laughs> traditional, or uh, innovator, and I actually, I do it on person based, not even on company based. I do it on per person based, and that's yeah. how I. And you should see those newsletters sometimes. It's like literally five, six words that are different, and most of the time is a subject line which is different, because I know it has different opening rates. Also, by the way, something nobody thinks about. I sometimes send a newsletter to an individual, and and this works really well. I would highly tune my newsletter to one or two persons because I know I can get through because it's more generic information. And then the second thing I do on newsletters is please have very short newsletters. My newsletters have six sentences, maybe four sentences with one or two clicks. That's it. Don't start with a visual because if you, for instance, look to HubSpot, I think we all know HubSpot newsletters. They always start with a visual. I think it's stupid because any email program will cut it. So your beautiful newsletter that you think is good looks shitty. So start with text, add the visual later. By the way, HubSpot is a very good example. They'll always give you two choices. Well, you've downloaded this. Why don't you talk to an expert, shortcut your time, or find even more information? That's exactly what they do. That's funneling. Exactly. So it's not about two databases. It's about uh, making sure that you be relevant at the right yeah. time. So your example of qualifying somebody or as traditional or innovative can be from help, but also the phases where they're in from their buyer journey. So that's, yeah. but it's always combined in one database. So not two. That's a yeah. great answer. There's another question from uh, Carlo. Um, he's working uh, with a lot of technical companies, he's saying, and the management he is facing is often uh, more operational and very detail driven than uh, uh, strategic. So what does that mean for your approach is his question. That means that you need to make a bit of a mix. Uh, what I would do is I uh, typically what you get is these type of companies have grown organically. One or two very technical people got together. They started building a company, picked up and started going like crazy and they're still in charge. So their heart, their nature, their, their, their inside is technical. And you got to fulfill that. They got to see if you're technically able of doing that. I have this problem in a lot of companies that sell like artificial intelligence and, and more complex uh, technology. They are always faced with people in front of them that actually really know what they're talking about, right? So what I would do there is I would have, I would, the, the key is sitting in the problem. I would actually have two, three problems and I would have two problems that are more operational oriented. And my third problem would be really a future oriented problem. That way you can basically cover both. Yeah, it makes sense. The only sense. way to solve it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, there's another question uh, from Jan. He is asking, they sell disruptive 3D printers. 
Yeah. So by the way, by the way, never, never ever use the word disruptive <laughs> because you will lose a lot of business by using the word disruptive. Don't do that. It's cool as a startup or scale up to do it, but actually you don't realize that you're cutting off your own leg. <laughs> Call it the next level, call it high tech, call, whatever you call it, but not disruptive. Okay, go on, sorry. No, no that's, uh, <laughs> that, that's, that's good information, I think. Um, but he says it's physical, uh, it's about physical products. So with a yeah. digital meeting, they cannot present the physical product. How not can they create? Not yeah, entirely that's the question. That the yeah. question is how do they create the feeling back in digital meetings? So I helped a company called Pickett. And what they do is they invented a, um, a, a camera. So if you have a robot arm and you see my arm, they put actually this uh, camera on top of the robot arm and they, they make the robot extremely intelligent. It can do really crazy stuff because of that. And the problem is if they have to show the, they can't bring the robot to everywhere. So what they do is they do two things. One, they do online meetings where they have a camera on the person. It's just a technology thing. They have a camera on the person and they have a camera on the robot. And they'll basically, while they'll explain, they do a demo. You can do it with videos, but actually I don't really like that video thing. Pre-recorded videos are always, people don't trust it, right? So if you can do it, you can either do it with the robot in your screen, do it like that so you can show it, how it works. In your case, I would do something really cool. So what the Picket guys did was they started saying as a pitch, send us your objects and we'll send you back a movie how the robot deals with the objects. So they actually have a camera on this and they send movies back with the, the, the robot picking all this stuff and then they send the box back. It's a service they do. And they, they at, at the moment, they have a big problem because they, one, they get too much of this inside. Two, you, they, they noticed that they posted some of these movies on YouTube and they had lots of viewers. And they what they've done now is they've put a real, <laughs> it's true, huh? it's like a real live stream on these robots moving. And they have... <laughs> They have over 500 people real time watching robots and it's really <laughs> so people love that shit. So in your case, I would say, send us your file, send us one file, we'll print something, we'll ship it back or we'll make a movie while we're printing it. Make it tangible. The more tangible you can make it, especially when you say the word disruptive, eh? tangible. We're faster than others. We do more surf, ta, ta, ta. Focus on that first. You'll get more deals, way more deals. Um... And final answer on that one, he says, you're a genius. <laughs> <laughs> That's why so I, lose, I lost all this hair. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so I really think you've added value here, uh, Michael. I really want to thank you. We're two minutes over time and I want to uh, 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 respect everybody's calendar because we, uh, we've seen in, the, in, 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 in your presentation, we at 11 o'clock, that's, uh, that's outreach time. So yeah. we, we, we are going to our next uh, thing. Um, thank you so much. I think you're a genius as well. Um, <laughs> and I really liked uh, this second webinar together. Um, thank you for your energy and all your insights. And um, yeah, we'll see each other soon. Thank see you guys. Soon. And thank you. see each other. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.